Hey everybody, good to see you all again virtually. Today we're going to be talking about color, and color is one of my favorite things to talk about because it's such an important tool for art making, uh, especially in the way that it can be used to connect expressively. For example, let's take a moment and look at these three portraits. Here we have portraits by the Clayton Brothers, Alice Neal, and Andre Durain. Take a look at these works for a moment and see if you can interpret the mood of each portrait. I've listed some possible options and I'm going to pause for a moment. Take a second and make a note of a mood for each portrait. Write it down. You can pause the video if you like. I'll wait. Alright, did you write it down? Good. Okay, so you might have noticed I've purposely selected portraits with flat facial expressions. All the emotions in these works are being determined by the colors the artists have chosen. So when you see that each one communicates with you differently, it's nothing that the portrait sitter, it's nothing that the face is doing. It's all done by color. Now let's pause and look at these three portraits. We've got uh, Alberto Giacometti, Arthur Beecher Charles, and Frank Auerbach. You can see these artists not only use color to convey emotion, but they've also manipulated the application of the paint. When an artist combines thoughtful color choices with intentional use of media, the result can be incredibly powerful. We should also take a moment and refresh ourselves on basic color theory. I'm sure you all remember our old friend, the color wheel. And of course, when I say old, I mean super old. This color wheel was first devised by Isaac Newton in 1706. He divided this color wheel into musical proportions, similar to octaves, around the circle. That's where we get the Roy G. Biv. And later those ideas were refined by various artists into the color wheel we all know and love. I'm not sure how you feel about the color wheel. Anyway, it basically gives a visual depiction of the relationship between colors. We have primary colors, when we mix primary colors, we get secondary colors, when we mix primary and secondary colors together, we get tertiary colors. And those are always named primary color first. Think red-orange and not orange-red. And then of course we have the properties of color. The hue, that's the name of the color. Value, which is the lightness or darkness of the color. And saturation, which is the brightness or dullness of the color. When we look at red, you can see the broad range of things that fall into the hue of red. There's tons of different reds out there. These are just some. So, value is pretty easy to understand. Lightening or darkening is most commonly done by adding white or black to a color. Add white and you have a tint, add black and you have a shade. And to affect saturation, you can either mix a hue with gray or the complement. A complement is the color directly across from the color wheel, and this gives you richer neutral tones, right? And you can kind of see that there at the bottom, adding that blue and orange together. Give you some really rich neutral tones. Now, when you're making a painting, you always want to work with light, bright, dark, and dull, right? You want a broad range of values and you want a broad range of saturation, right? A good painting includes a mix of light colors, bright colors, dark colors, and dull colors. Now let's look at this painting by Peter Bloom. This is one of my favorites growing up. I would go see it at the Art Institute of Chicago all the time. You can see the intentional use of a broad range of value. When I converted this image to black and white, you can see the image is still bold and clear. Now this is a great trick for young artists. Since we all have cell phones, you can easily take a picture of your work and remove the color to check to see if you are using a full range of value. Sometimes people get lost and they see a lot of colors and they think they have a range of value when they don't. So if you turn your painting grayscale and your painting practically disappears, that means you have no contrast and that's bad. Also, I want you to think about how saturation can be used to create a strong focal point. An intense color draws the viewer's attention, so use intense colors carefully. Many painters advise that you rarely use paint directly out of the tube, as that tube of paint is usually the most intense version of the hue. One more thing I want you to think about is how color is subjective. 
we have the visual impression of color, the emotional expression of a color, and the symbolic construction of a color. And this isn't universal to everyone. These things vary based on the personal experiences of our lives and our eyesight. In America, red often symbolizes passion or danger. That doesn't mean it's what it means everywhere. In India, red is one of the most powerful of all colors. It represents fear and fire, wealth and power, purity and fertility, seduction, love and beauty. Red is also representative of a certain time and place in one's personal life, including when a woman gets married. A married woman can be identified by the red henna on her hands and the red powder known as sindoor worn along her hairline. In South Africa, red is associated with mourning, and the section of red in the country's flag symbolizes violence and sacrifices that were made during the struggle for independence. In Chinese culture, red is traditionally worn on the New Year, as well as during funerals and weddings. It represents celebration and is meant to bring luck, prosperity, happiness, and a long life to the people. And so, we have to think about that when we're using a color. What is it going to mean to the viewer? How are we using this color to communicate, right? When we use a color, something like black, we have, you know, the universe, um, death and mourning in the United States, the, uh, the idea of the black hole, the social construction of race in America. All these things are plugged into the word black and the color black. So that's something we have to take into account if we're going to use that color, or at least be aware of. And then of course with blue, think about all the emotions you can feel with blue. Right? Blue is often like singing the blues. You're depressed, but blue skies mean happy days. So you've got that whole range of visual cues with the color blue and associations and memories that come along with it. Now, of course, you can't take into account everybody's memories and associations with every color, but you should pay attention to the fact that colors have meaning and that when we're using them in our work, we have to pay attention to the fact that they have meaning and they have memory and lots of different associations for people. So, today, we're going to play with that idea of color having meaning and memory. Hop into the module and see exactly what I'm talking about. And if you have any questions, send me an email or hit me up through the inbox, whatever you need to do. Have a great day, everybody. I'll talk to you later.